I have a few announcements this morning. The session has called a congregational meeting for today, March 7th, 2021, at 10.15 a.m. between services for the purpose of presenting the annual reports to the congregation. The meeting is going to be held right here in the sanctuary, and it is subject to COVID-19 restrictions and regulations and all such things, as you all know very well. Today we welcome the Reverend Ralph B. Wright, who is right behind me there, he's waving. We welcome him back to the pulpit. Ralph, thank you so much for coming back and celebrating the Lord's table with us, and speaking the word of God to us. We look forward to what God has placed on your heart for us. The trustees and session are encouraging everyone to please do their best to honor their pledges, as the budget is very tight right now. You know things are difficult for everybody. It's been a wild ride uh, this past year, but we ask you to do your very best if you can. The thrift shop is closed until further notice. Uh, it is not accepting any donations at this time. Please do not leave items outside the church. Somebody left a whole bunch of stuff outside by the dumpster there the other day, uh, and we had to uh, deal with that. So please don't leave anything outside the church as it's just going to be thrown away anyway. Thank you for your help with this. Uh, concerning John's Place, uh, NPC is responsible for preparing dinner for our homeless guests, and that's every second Thursday of the month and any fifth Thursday of a month if that should occur. Jeannie Berliner will be preparing the meals, but the cost of the food is funded by donations. An envelope is labeled John's Place, and that's in the pews. Please consider donating to help provide food for our guests. And I just want to take a minute and just say thank you to everybody that volunteered and worked for John's Place this year. It's a vital ministry that this church is involved in, and we've been so faithful in that ministry. And you can just imagine how difficult and challenging it was to do John's Place uh, through COVID. So I am very thankful for all the people that were involved in John's Place. And I pray for you all the time, and I pray a blessing upon you, uh, that God would keep you safe. Uh, I am so thankful for Melissa and Molly and Fred, so please continue to pray for them as well. Uh, and let's prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. Find it in your bulletins. It's a responsive call to worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. The Lord teaches us his decrees so that we may keep them till the end. With my whole heart I seek you, Lord. Do not let me stray from your commands. The Lord gives us understanding that we may keep his law. May I treasure your word in my heart, O Lord, so that I do not sin against you. We have chosen the way of faithfulness, O God. May we always bless your holy name. May your praise always be on my lips, and may the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. May the meditations of our heart O oh Lord, be acceptable to you, our rock and redeemer. If you are able, please stand to your feet this morning. Today is the day that the Lord has made.
Father, we lift you up this morning in glad praise. We exalt your holy name. God, we recognize that without you, we are nothing. Without your calling, without your love, we are lost. We praise you this morning and we consider Calvary. We consider Lord Jesus and think about what you have done for us and how you purchased salvation for us when we were lost. How you came and found us and gathered us together like sheep that have gone astray. And you called us to your name. For that we are forever grateful. Lord Jesus, the grave could not hold you. The persecutions, the mocking, the beating could not overwhelm you. The rejection of the world could not hold you down, but you broke forth in glory. And now, Lord, you reign above all gods, above all nations, above all kings, above all powers. And it's to you this morning that we say, praise the name. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord our God. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Every eye on Jesus, every heart towards him, not on anything else. We thank you, Lord. Every heart, every eye, every desire on Jesus this morning.
everybody and wave and smile underneath that mask. Let them know. We now come to the time of prayer. And we have prayer requests that are printed in the bulletin. But I've also been added to me today, given to me, a prayer for Tom Roseberry, who had a mild heart attack. And he had a multiple bypass of 90% blockage with surgery. And he's our friend in Virginia. And this is signed by Reg and Sheila. Uh, so um, we remember them, remember him particularly, but also the whole family in our prayers this morning. Are there any other prayer requests that we have from the congregation? Yes. <coughs> Pray for a peace in Haiti. Um, <coughs> maybe someday we actually get to go back down there and visit our friends. It's been a disaster for years now, as far as unrest. We pray harshly. We pray with our faith for them as well. Thank you. Any other prayer for us? Way back there. Okay. Oh, he's asking for prayer for Joan Kioski. Is that it, Danny? Yeah. <coughs> Joan Kioski. Joan Kioski. Joan Kioski. Kioski. Yeah. Sorry. My ears are not still ringing from the playing video. <laughs> <laughs> I have another prayer request, and that will be in the prayer, and that has to do for Christians in places like Nigeria, like Syria, like Lebanon like Turkey, and go right on down through the Middle East from Iran, Iraq, and on over to Pakistan and Northern India, and particularly the Christian church in China. And we pray for all of them this morning as well. Let us now bow our heads in a moment of prayer. Help us, God, to close our eyes and to listen for your voice. Lead us on the road that you want us to travel and keep us safe each day of our lives. We give you thanks today, O oh God, for who you are, for your majesty and your power, for your holiness and your love, for what you have made and how you watch over it. Most of all, we thank you for your invitation to us to be a part of you, to be a part of your family, to be made new by your spirit, and to see the new heaven and the new earth with our own eyes. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving and compassionate God, you know that the battle of good and evil rages within and around us, and that our ancient foe tempts us with his deceits and empty promises. We pray that you would keep us steadfast in your word. And when we fall, raise us again and restore us through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is tempted as we are tempted, but resisted the wiles of the evil one. And Father, in these moments, when we are, see our weaknesses and our strengths being tested, fill us with your holy presence that we may always remember whose we are. Keep from us the temptation to give up on seeking to do your will and shield us from the despair that doubts your goodness. Help us to remember that you are the one who is able to move the world in which we live, the one who gives new life. No, Lord, our God, listen to the voice of your church calling to you from the desert of this world. Protect us with your strong hands and outstretched arms that nourished by the bread of your word and fortified by your spirit, we may proclaim the good news of your love to all people in word and deed, even as Jesus showed us. We pray particularly now for Christians who are under attack in countries far from us, such as Nigeria, Ethiopia, Iraq, India, and China. And we also pray for churches in Syria, Lebanon, and Turkey as they struggle to survive in a war-torn area of our planet. 
and gracious God, in the midst of our despair brought by the coronavirus, our souls yearn for the love that comes from you, the love that wells up in us like streams of living water and brings life to us and to those around us. Help us to open our lives to you, to put down our roots in your word, and to turn our hands both upward and outward that we may receive and give your blessings. Grant, O oh God, that we may be a people who in speaking truth do not judge those of whom to whom we speak. Help us to reap the harvest which others have sown and to sow so that others may reap. And Father, hear our prayers for those of our brothers and sisters whose names are upon our hearts at this time. We remember them and all those who are in need around our world this day before you during this time of silent meditation. God of holy love, thank you for the living and everlasting water you pour out for us and for our world through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask all these prayers in the name of him who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Let us bow our heads for the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. There are two scripture lessons this morning. The first is from the Hebrew Testament, the book of Exodus, 20th chapter, verses 1 through 17. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them, or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day, by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigners residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land of the Lord, your God. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This endeth the Exodus reading. Now let me proceed to the reading from John, the Gospel, the second chapter verses 13 through 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of them from the temple courts. Both sheep and cattle, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here, stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And they replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. These are the words of our God. Praise be to you, O God. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, strengthen and sustain us in our study of your scriptures. May we learn more of your love and understanding as well as how we should live our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
We are now in the middle of Lent. Lent is a time of reflection, but it has also been a time of fasting for some, not because it's a good tradition necessarily, but in the Middle Ages and in some places even in this world today, including the United States, as the winter proceeds and it's still cold, we run out of food. That's one end of the winter and before spring could produce crops. And so we're locked up in our homes. We're locked up as the end of winter is here and it is still depressing. I guess we all know how that can be since we've been experiencing the coronavirus pandemic lockdowns for some time. Yes, we too, this year, can experience and know how depressing it can be. And therefore, going back to the Middle Ages as well as now, there was a soul-touching event which took place in the middle of Lent called Bright Sunday or Holy Humor Sunday. That's jokes, folks. That's being able to laugh, so you can laugh in church, no problem. It grew to a time when Hilarity Sunday, another name for it, was looked upon eagerly as an occasion for people to join in praise and in laughter and good humor in celebrating God's love for us. Choirs, which have already disappeared from me here today, but they stood up and they sung silly songs. And church members would dress up outlandish. I don't see any outlandish people out there, but that's okay. And the preacher, <laughs> he would be a stand-up comedian. And you can tell me after the show, no, I mean after the <laughs> service, whether I stood up to that or not. This was not for every congregation, but for many it would turn a cold Sunday in Lent into a Sunday with a new glow. So let me give you a few stand-up jokes. This is the time to rejoice. And the congregation responds, what better time than now? This is the day to laugh. What did the cabbage pastor say to the people? Let us pray. <laughs> Think that one through. We're in the farm country, we know what lettuce is. Second one. How many choir directors does it take to change a light bulb? No one knows because no one ever watches the director. <laughs> oh, rim shots. Here's one for all of us. How many Presbyterians does it take to change a light bulb? Change? Presbyterians don't believe in change. <laughs> Think about that particularly during the annual meeting coming up. And what did the Sunday school teacher say to her class? What commandment teaches us how to treat our brothers and sisters? And the little boy up front said, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> and the pastor said, no, the great commandment, love one another. I hope I got some smiles out of you, even a chuckle, for Christians need to be happy. <coughs> not dour and dull. So let's go back to the scripture lessons of today, the Ten Commandments. Frankly, there is not enough time in any church service, whether it's here or it's in a service of the old Calvinist tradition that went on for two hours, and we're lucky we're having that time nowadays. But the point is, is that there is never enough time to preach on the Ten Commandments. In fact, if you can preach on one or two on a Sunday, that is fantastic. But right in the middle of Lent, in the lectionary, there it is, Exodus 20, the Ten <coughs> Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments are also known as the Decalogue. And that's basically out of the Latin and Greek. And they're a set of biblical principles relating to ethics and worship that plays a fundamental role not only in Christianity, but also in Judaism. In the text of the Ten Commandments, you can find in Exodus 20 or in Deuteronomy 5. Scholars disagree about when the Ten Commandments were written and by whom. 
with some modern scholars suggesting that the Ten Commandments were likely modeled on Hittite and Mesopotamian laws and treaties. And according to the book of Exodus in the Torah, the Ten Commandments were revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. Not Mount Sinai in Long Island, but Mount Sinai in Israel. In Biblical Hebrew, the Ten Commandments are called a number of words which I won't pronounce because my Hebrew is ter terrible. I was raised in Brooklyn. My uh, background is more Yiddish than uh, Hebrew, but that's the same. It really translates out to the words, the Ten Words. We say the Ten Commandments, but in Hebrew it comes through as the Ten Words. And some say the Ten Sayings. And then there's another group that say the Ten Matters. So no matter how you translate it, it comes out a different way, but it's always the number 10. In the Septuagint, the 10 words were translated then as the Decalogue, which is derived from the Greek Decalogus, the latter meaning and referring to the Greek translation. And I won't bother with, with all that, but you have to know that the Ten Commandments as it's come to us in our Bible has actually gone through a number of what you might call changes. Not necessarily bad changes, it's a matter of staying with the words that people understand. The Tyndale and Coverdale English Bible translations use ten verses. So in the early English translations, it didn't say ten commandments, it said ten verses. It wasn't until we got to the Geneva Bible, which by the way is the English translation that was done in Geneva, Switzerland, called the Ten Commandments, which was followed then by the Bishop's Bible and the authorized version, which we call the King James Version. So most English versions now use the word commandments. Now there's another thing that we need to remember is that the commandments weren't written on scrolls. The commandments originally were written on tablets, stone tablets, and so at times, it's been referred to as the Tablets of the Covenant. The biblical narrative of the revelation at Sinai begins in Exodus 19. And it begins with the arrival of the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, which is also called Horeb, H-O-R-E-B. And on the morning of the third day of their encampment, there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceedingly loud. And the people assembled at the base of the mount. And after the Lord came down upon Sinai, Moses went up briefly and returned with the stone tablets and prepared the people. And then in Exodus 20, God spoke to all the people the words of the covenant that is in the Ten Commandments, as it is written. Modern biblical scholarship differs as to whether Exodus describes the people of Israel as having directly heard some of the Decalogue or whether the laws are only passed on through Moses. So when we're dealing with the ancient world, we still have questions, but that isn't the reason why we study it to find out who was right and who was wrong. We study it to find out what God wants us to do. And that's why we have the Ten Commandments. Now, I would hope that all of you have seen Cecil D. DeMille's Ten Commandments. It's a fantastic movie. It stays fairly close to the Bible. It's very literal in many ways, but I would really say, take your kids to see it. I once carried uh, the 35 millimeter Ten Commandments in large crates from Hollywood, where I was working at the time, with Charlton Heston, who was going to uh, Ethiopia with us. And I carried them to Ethiopia to share with the people there so they could see it. And would you believe the government didn't want anyone to see it? And so we brought them back. But there was a private showing, at least for a couple members of our community of the Red Cross that were there. So the Ten Commandments are not always looked upon by what you would call the imperial powers with a great deal of respect because it threatens their, whatever we want to call it, authority. Now the Lord said to Moses, come up unto me on the mount. And 
and he did. And the mount was covered by the cloud for six days. And on the seventh day, Moses went into the midst of the cloud and was in on the mount there for 40 days and 40 nights. It wasn't something which was quick. And the Lord delivered unto him two tablets of stone written with the fingers of God. On them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you on the mount. And so that's how we have the tablets. In all probability, Moses was the one, obviously, who carved it out on those tablets. And then, after the full 40 days, Moses and Joshua, who was with him, came down from the mountain with the tablets of stone. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh into the camp, he saw the calf! Now, I, I'm being political, I have to say this, but in the last week or so, they've been talking about the uh, golden calf in the presidency of the United States, but this wasn't the same one. This was the golden calf that the people there had decided to start worshiping because of the fact that Moses had left them and they left God, the God of Moses, away. And so it's that point that Moses was so angry, he took the tablets and threw them down and broke them. Then he had to go back up and get some new tablets. This, my friends, is the basic story of how we got the Ten Commandments. Now, different religious groups, and properly so, I'm not going to say one is better than the other, have taken the Ten Commandments and, or actually that whole section of Exodus, and broken it down in different ways. We in the Western Church are basically all together. But if you go into the Eastern Church, you can find some shifts on what is commandment number eight, commandment number nine, and particularly the last commandment, number 10, which is very long. So let me go quickly through the 10 commandments as we have it within our tradition. The first one is, I am the Lord thy God. Very important. And I'm just gonna put it aside here. I find that many young people in the world today do not have a concept of who God is. We are living in a godless society to some degree. And it's up to us in the church to spread the good news that God is our Lord. And then the second commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Ah, all you have to do is look on TV and you can find all the gods that people follow. And I'm not talking about religious gods. Many of them are secular gods, which includes, sorry folks, money and fame and other things which are more important than God himself. Then it says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, which means we don't make idols. And that's why in our Calvinist tradition, if you look around here, all we have is a cross. We don't have other, but that is not really the, where we need to be. What we need to be is not worshiping a golden calf or worshiping an idol in the church. And then the fourth one is, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And hey, <laughs> I can't say enough about how I hear people cursing all over the time. And you, you know better than I do. And if you're working in the fields and you get stuck in the blades of a spreader or something like that, you probably will begin to curse. I know that. And that's not a problem. That's just where we are. And then we move on. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Oh, the Sabbath day in this country is no longer kept holy. And I don't know how to bring about a change other than we as a community, as a congregation, do it in our own way. But we need to keep the Sabbath day holy. I mean, I wasn't even allowed to uh, use roller skates on Sunday when I was a boy. And I can go on down the list. I'm sure most of you with a little gray hair can remember those days as well. And then, honor thy father and mother. Extremely important. 
problem in our society today is who's my father and who's my mother? I have too many of them because we have, unfortunately, divorce and separation and such. But we need to overcome that and we need to carefully work with whatever family ties we have. And then the seventh one is thou shalt not, here's the problem, it says now in the Bible, murder. But actually I was raised as thou shalt not kill. And there's been a big debate going. Why? Because we belong to the armed forces and we're trained to kill. And we don't want the soldiers to have guilt. And so we use the word murder. And there's some truth in that, but I'm just throwing that out so you understand how there can be debates about what commandments actually mean. And then the next one is, thou shalt not commit adultery. I can only say Jesus said, anyone who even thinks about it has committed adultery. And then the ninth one is, thou shalt not steal. Plagiarism is a bigger problem in our world today than taking money out of someone's coin box. But it's there, and we have to be aware of it. And then finally, this is the one that goes on. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, nor covet thy neighbor's house, his wife, his slaves, animals, nor anything else. That's something we need to remember very carefully. Now Jesus was aware in his earthly ministry of these Ten Commandments. He was also aware that rather than following closely these commandments, many gave it lip service, as we do too, and went about their regular life as if the commandments didn't matter. And therefore, the second reading of this morning points out, and that's the Gospel of John, the story of Jesus driving the money changers out of the temple. He was leading a silent protest rally. Yes and no. He came in quietly, but he actually took action. And he drove the sheep out. He drove the doves out. He drove the money changers out. He took action. And frankly, points to us as Christians that we have a responsibility to drive certain things out. We're not just to contemplate and meditate the Ten Commandments. We're to put them into action. And that, my friends, is difficult because what one person thinks about one thing is not necessarily what the other person thinks. And it creates tension within churches, tension within communities, tensions within the world. And so we have to remember that other commandment that we should love our neighbors as ourselves and we should work together. There's a lot that can be said about the Ten Commandments and I really am not a hard-nosed Calvinist, but I really believe we need to go back to them and to look at our lives and look at our church lives and our community lives and reevaluate some of these things. And some of the issues we have today don't really fit easily. And I'll show you one, what I call a difficult situation or difficult issue to deal with, which is in the church, it has to do with abortion. Where does that fit in the Ten Commandments? Well, you could say, thou shalt not murder. But that, is that really an extension of what was meant in that era or not? The same thing can be said about the role of peacekeeping troops that are out in the middle of Afghanistan or Iran or even today still in Germany. These are things which are not easily handled in the Ten Commandments. And that's why we need dialogue. And we need to remember once again, love thy neighbors as thyself. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, give us strength to understand thy directions for our lives. And help us 
that we give ourselves to one another and help us to build bridges of care that affirm our common humanity and mirror God's compassion for us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we prepare now for communion, let us stand together and say together the tenets of the Christian faith, which we find in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hopefully my yes it is working. Microphones are on. Unbelievable how you have to be wired for sound to be a pastor nowadays, but that's okay. We come to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. All baptized followers of Jesus Christ are welcome to receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. It is our tradition to hold the bread and the cup and to all have received and then partake in unison. Today we're working a little differently and, and we will work it out as we are here in pandemic time. We have different views of the sacrament. The Roman Catholic view is that the bread and the wine literally becomes the flesh and blood of Jesus. The Anabaptist view is that the bread and wine always remains just bread and wine. The reformers are all as usual or in the middle. We believe that, yes, it remains bread and wine, but Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is with us as we partake of the bread and wine, and it becomes special and gives us strength, and we can feel the love of God in Christ. And though each tradition and its members have different ways of understanding the sacrament, we all together can worship the same God and receive the same blessings from Jesus, our Savior. That is the beauty of the Christian faith as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And so as they say down south, you all come. You're all welcome to receive the sacraments in this service. And now the invitation. Friends, this is a joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and from west, from north and from south and sit at a table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. And now the great prayer of thanksgiving. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord. It is right to give God's thanks and praise. And now we come to the breaking of the bread and sharing of the cup. It is indeed right to give you our thanks and praise, O God, for in you and through you all righteousness is fulfilled. And when your voice first thundered over the seas, you created the heavens and spread out the earth. You breathed the spirit of life into us and called the people to be a light to the nations. And when the time came to declare new things among us, you gave us your servant, Jesus Christ. You were chosen in whom you are well pleased. You anointed him with Holy Spirit and with power and sent him to open blinded eyes and release those imprisoned in darkness. And when he was put to death, you raised him on the third day making the earth shudder with the birth pains of new life 
and raising with him all who have died with him in the waters of baptism. And therefore, with the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we praise you, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And wherefore, we set before you this table, remembering the words and actions of Jesus on the night he was betrayed. We recall as he celebrated the Passover love of God with his disciples, how he took bread. And I have bread here. He took bread and gave you thanks, O God, as even we now thank you for the bread of life that you give to us. And broke it and passed it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. We recall, too, how he took the cup. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is the cup, the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, this do in remembrance of me. And so, let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us. And upon these gifts, sanctify them, making them for us the bread of life and the cup of salvation. The body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit. To the one who declared that we are one family when he taught us to pray. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ Let us now give thanks to God through Christ our Lord. Life-giving God, may we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink this cup bring new life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so that we and all your children shall be free, and all creation live to praise your name. Amen. Now we come to our closing hymn. God of grace and God of glory.
go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. Go in peace. Love and care for one another in Christ's name. And may God so bless you that all who see you or hear you feel welcome in your presence. May the Spirit so touch you that others are comforted by your words and your actions. And may Jesus dwell in you so richly that others are drawn to God by you. This both now and forevermore.